Today, Apple is the most valuable company in the world, with a peerless reputation for slick, stylish gadgets that are desperately coveted by its vast army of devoted worldwide superfans. But the outlook wasn't always so rosy for the Cupertino firm. Indeed, perhaps Apple's most important product launch ever led directly to the company's most striking commercial flop. So today, we're revisiting one of tech history's greatest what-ifs and asking why the first Apple Macintosh computer failed. The year is 1984, and a vigorous young entrepreneur named Steve Jobs, sporting rather more hair than later followers might recognize, is addressing a hushed auditorium in California to announce the birth of his new baby. And with the uncanny knack for dramatic timing that would rapidly become his trademark, Jobs unveiled the Apple Macintosh to a waiting world. Priced at around $2,500, the Macintosh was supposed to single-handedly drag personal computing from the realms of drab business back offices and bring it to its rightful place in the heart of every home. The on-stage demonstration computer even introduced itself to the crowd with a cheery, Hello, I'm Macintosh, it sure is great to get out of that bag. It's important we remember that up to this point, computers weren't at all user-friendly and certainly nowhere near as much fun. And though steadily more and more consumers were buying computers for their homes, for instance the Commodore 64 or cult favourite Sinclair Spectrum, computing was still very much a niche interest. The most important difference between those humble home computers and the omnipresent models we see around us everywhere today is in the interface. Back then, even top-of-the-range models like the $5,000 IBM PC XT offered users nothing more eye-catching than a black screen and typewriter-like lines of blinking green and white text. To get anything done, you'd need to have a decent knowledge of coding just to input instructions in a manner the machine could understand. Jobs' great innovation, well, technically he stole the idea from Xerox, but that's another story, was to make his Macintosh appealing with a smart user interface. This Macintosh was the first mass-market computer to employ the so-called WIMP, Windows, Icons, Mouse, Pointer interface so familiar to millions of us today. Referencing Bob Dylan's classic hit, The Times They Are a Change In, Steve Jobs cannily set about marketing his new computer not just as an aspirational labour-saving gadget, but as a way of sticking it to presiding market leader IBM. It is now 1984, boomed Jobs, very consciously invoking the spectre of George Orwell. It appears that IBM wants it all, he continued. Apple is perceived to be the only hope to offer IBM a run for its money. Dealers, after initially welcoming IBM with open arms, now fear an IBM-dominated and controlled future and are turning back to Apple as the only force who can ensure their future freedom. Jobs certainly had a point. At this time, IBM was very much the dominant force in computing, even though their hardware wasn't especially impressive by later standards. Still, the brand was king, to the extent that in the corporate procurement world, it was often remarked without irony that nobody was ever fired for buying IBM. Steve Jobs' effort to make his personal computer friendly extended, quite brilliantly, to the very form of the device. It had a discrete handle built into the top of the case and was carefully engineered to be lightweight and portable. Never trust a computer you can't lift, he joked. Upon launch, buoyed by another wonderfully unsubtle Orwell reference in the shape of Apple's $1.5 million Ridley Scott-directed 1984 Super Bowl ad, the Macintosh sold a robust 70,000 in just three months. However, sales quickly tailed off, to the point it was shifting only around 10,000 units a month. This was seen as such a failure, Steve Jobs was forced out of his own company within just 18 months. So why did it fail? The Macintosh was certainly expensive for what it was. Steve Jobs, to his credit, thought the market would probably bear to pay around $2,000, but CEO John Scully overruled him, adamant the unit should be priced at $2,495 in order to recoup the colossal marketing spend lavished on this highly speculative product. A quarter of a century after this clash with Scully, Steve Jobs was still apparently bitter, telling his biographer, Walter Isaacson, that the price tag was the main reason Macintosh sales slowed and Microsoft got to dominate the market. In fairness, Macintosh also suffered a raft of technical shortcomings. It had neither an internal hard drive nor the means to accommodate an external one. It was shipped with only 128K of RAM, compared with the then prodigious 1000K RAM shipped with contemporary Apple computer Lisa, which was more aimed at the business end of the market. Macintoshes didn't even come with an internal fan, on the insistence of Jobs, who believed the racket from the blades would detract from his vision of a slick, seamless user experience. Alas, the inevitable overheating this caused led to a great many component failures and landed Macintosh with the unfortunate nickname of the Beige Toaster. Also, and again considering the price, Macintosh didn't actually do very much. Compared with PCs, they only offered about a quarter of the software applications. Word processors and spreadsheets are all very well, but it was only thanks to much later models that Macs secured their reputation as a favourite tool of creatives and arty publishing types. The press ultimately wrote off Macintosh as a nifty but ultimately overpriced toy.
Internal competition at Apple didn't help. The Lisa had significantly better screen resolution and a great deal more memory, which surely poached more than a few customers who might otherwise have splashed out on a Mac. Still, while IBM and its many clones, boasting lower costs and a greater range of available software, as well as the unmatched market penetration of Microsoft Windows, ran ahead and dominated the personal computer market during the boom years to come, Macintosh can still hold its head high. As the earliest popular adopter of the WIMP interface, Macintosh astutely prioritized user-friendliness and elegance above raw functionality, something all Apple products do with distinction to this day. A contemporary ad for the first Macintosh rather sums up the product's grand vision and stands the test of time as a worthy keynote for all the world-beating Apple tech that would ultimately follow in its wake. In the olden days, before 1984, not very many people used computers, read the ad copy. Then, on a particularly bright day in Cupertino, California, some particularly bright engineers had a particularly bright idea. Since computers are so smart, wouldn't it make more sense to teach computers about people instead of teaching people about computers? For the first time in recorded computer history, hardware engineers actually talked to software engineers in moderate tones of voice, and both were united by a common goal – to build the most powerful, most portable, most flexible, most versatile computer not very much money could buy. And thus, despite a few initial commercial hiccups, an icon was born. What do you think? Was Steve Jobs a world-changing genius even then, or does he owe all his success to forerunners like Xerox? Would you have bought the first Macintosh when it came out? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to hit subscribe for more user-friendly tech content.